Welcome back to Parents of Patriots for our sixth and final episode in our series titled Sinister SEL. I'm Lisa Logan, your host. Today we'll cover what kind of social emotional learning assessments your school district might be using, if that data is protected, and the forecast of what that sensitive data could be used for. Let's dive in. In the last video, we talked about the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and their study on social emotional skills. That study is being administered to nine other countries and only one U.S. city, Houston, Texas. And while I have no doubt in my mind that they could branch out to more U.S. cities, I also don't want to give you any false assurances that if your child doesn't live in Houston at the moment, that their social emotional skills aren't being assessed and scored. Big tech giants like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg are behind these efforts to collect your students' data. In fact, one of the largest social emotional learning assessment companies in the United States is Panorama Education, funded mostly in part by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. It works hand in glove with SEL programs to measure your child's values, attitudes, and beliefs about many topics, some of which include race and gender identity, through surveys which they call screeners. Not surprisingly, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative also funds the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, or CASEL. They are the organization I talked about in Sinister SEL Part 3 that sets the standards by which all SEL programs are measured against and which Panorama assesses. Considering that CASEL has now changed their social emotional learning competencies to reflect their new woke definition of transformative SEL, there seems to be a very clear agenda at play of making sure that the critical and racial consciousness learned through SEL programs aligned with CASEL standards are internalized by the students. The fact that Zuckerbucks are involved at all is concerning as well. You may remember that Facebook and Cambridge Analytica were exposed for their controversial partnership to data mine Facebook users during both the 2012 and 2016 presidential campaigns to determine the psychological makeup of voters. Using that data, the company assigned a score to each voter it then tailored ads accordingly and targeted those voters with them. It makes you wonder what they're using the psychological data for in Panorama to target our kids with. You may remember that Panorama itself was in the news last year, not just for the questionable organizations funding the gathering of all sorts of personal data on your children, but because of its connections to Attorney General Merrick Garland, who weaponized the DOJ against parents and labeled them domestic terrorists for speaking out at board meetings. Turns out his son-in-law, Zan Tanner, was one of the founders of the organization that parents were criticizing because of its surveys that contained leading questions about race, gender, and sexuality. No conflict of interest there. While many of the questions are not available to parents because their surveys are copyrighted, Erica Sanzi of Parents Defending Ed posted two survey questions allegedly made by Panorama asking 12-year-olds about their gender and sexuality preferences. Quote, One of the images appears to show a survey asking whether the respondent is gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, aromantic, asexual, or questioning. A second screenshot is a question simply asking the respondent's gender, then adds the following options, male, female, transgender male, transgender female, gender queer or gender fluid, questioning, my identity is not listed, and prefer not to answer. These questions introduce students to, and normalize the acceptance of, the debatable concept of gender theory, in which the idea there are only two genders is merely a social construct, basically made up by society, as if there exists a broad variation in gender and sexual identity that differs from the societal norm. In this panorama survey on diversity and inclusion, students are asked how often they spend time with people at school who are a different race, ethnicity, or culture than them. Will this count against your social emotional learning score if they don't? This survey on cultural awareness and action asks a slew of questions about how much they think and talk about race, including how often do students at your school have important conversations about race, even when they might be uncomfortable, and how well does your school help students speak out against racism? Now, do I believe that racism should be handled and discussed, especially when it occurs at school or in the surrounding community? Yes, of course. But when they ask the question, how often do students at your school have important conversations about race even when they might be uncomfortable, what they're actually referring to is talks about critical race theory concepts. Critical race theory is a Marxist ideology that asserts that race is a social construct, again, something that's made up in society, used to exploit people of color. 
Critical race theorists hold that racism is inherent and exists in all the institutions and systems of the United States. They believe those institutions and systems function to create and maintain social, economic, and political inequalities between whites and non-whites, especially African Americans. And if you're a white person, because you exist and thrive within this racist institutional or structural framework, then they believe you naturally have power, privilege, and supremacy and want to keep the status quo. That is why white students will have to have, quote, important and uncomfortable conversations about race. It is believed that they have to recognize their unconscious implicit bias and deal with their internalized racism, which they are guilty of simply because of the color of their skin. Panorama themselves believe in this ideology as evidenced by their statement released in 2020, which says, quote, we commit to dismantling systemic racism. We commit to embodying and spreading anti-racist practices, end quote. Again, the term anti-racist isn't defined as what you probably think it is, which is not racist. Because, of course, all of us would agree that that's a good thing. In their eyes, and others who espouse anti-racism, simply being not racist does not require active resistance to and the tearing down of the system, which they feel is set up and operates in such a way to intentionally oppress people of color. Being anti-racist does, and they want to use social-emotional learning and the assessments used to measure those skills to turn your children into social justice activists toward that cause. So how do they measure if the children are buying into this ideology and the other Marxist theories that are being pushed through education? On a dashboard that looks something like this. These are the social-emotional learning skills Panorama can assess in individual students, on the class or school as a whole, and in curated groups. Panorama quantifies and measures the following about your kids. Self-efficacy, grit, self-management, social awareness, sense of belonging, and classroom effort, which includes emotional regulation, engagement, learning strategies, and social perspective taking. Listen to Panorama explain it themselves. With Panorama, you can start by measuring students' social emotional learning skills and supports with research-backed surveys and assessments. It's easy to customize a survey that meets your district's needs, as you can choose from over 22 topics like growth mindset, social awareness, and self-management or any of the topics that align to the CASEL framework. The survey will take students about 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and teachers and staff can also rate their students' skills right from within Panorama. Once the data is collected, get immediate insight into student voice, what students are thinking, and how they feel about their skills, habits, and mindsets. See how each score compares to Panorama's national benchmarks. Then dig deeper to explore each topic in more detail, like how it's changed over time, or any gaps between student groups, and how students responded to each question individually. Then, identify individual students' strengths and opportunities for growth by filtering student-level SEL results to create smart groups, which will update as new SEL surveys are run over time allowing you to add specific students to a group for more targeted intervention and progress monitoring. And best of all, our team is always here to help with professional development, training, and support. That's why Panorama is used by thousands of schools and districts across the country. Get in touch with our team to learn how to start using Panorama today. So Panorama surveys can measure any topic, quote, that aligns with CASEL's framework and can identify students for growth opportunities and targeted intervention. Again, it begs the question, if students are asked how often they spend time with people at school who are a different race, ethnicity, or culture than them, and they answer almost never, will this count against their score in social perspective taking? I'd like to know. Also, what does targeted intervention look like? Panoram has already thought about that too. To increase scores and create growth opportunities for all the social-emotional skills they're measuring, they'll need social-emotional learning curriculum to indoctrinate, uh, I mean teach, students how they should think and behave. They say here on their website that districts and schools using their SEL measurement platform gain access to age-appropriate lesson plans, interventions, video-guided practices, and interactive activities from leading curriculum providers who specialize in student and adult SEL. 
Students and teachers need to know that their voices are changing mindsets and impacting practices. That's why we created Playbook, an online professional learning library of research-backed and evidence-based SEL interventions for kindergarten through high school. Right inside Playbook, educators can find hundreds of strategies from dozens of leading SEL curriculum providers, like Second Step, Conscious Discipline, Character Strong, and Move This World. On everything from supporting students' social-emotional growth to building adult capacity for SEL. Every strategy on Playbook maps directly to a topic on Panorama surveys, so educators can move directly from reviewing Panorama data into taking action, filter interventions by grade level, curriculum provider, and topic, access videos, online courses, or download handouts and guides to use in the classroom, and create a personal library of bookmarked strategies. Playbook is the best way to embed data-driven, social-emotional learning strategies into the fabric of your school community. We've already discussed the social-emotional learning program's second step and the many problems with it in detail in Sinister SEL 4. One thing to note here is that most curricula your school district adopts has to go through a rigorous multi-step process that usually includes scrutiny by many stakeholders, including both your local school board and patrons of the district. I'm curious to know if any of the materials they provide through their playbook is vetted this way or if they're just circumventing that process. Another thing to note is that social emotional learning curricula and surveys often ask students to share information about topics that are usually addressed in therapeutic settings. When children who have experienced trauma and or are in therapy are asked questions about their emotions or sensitive topics, it can have detrimental consequences. There are no warnings given to parents that these surveys may ask the type of questions that can trigger a reaction for these types of children. Teachers are not qualified to address the needs of a child having anxiety, a depressive episode, or a panic attack from taking a test which brings up sensitive and emotional feelings as a result of the questions asked. It puts teachers and students in an unfair, vulnerable position by asking teachers to practice psychology without a license. In fact, a principal at a Utah school shared with me that he had a parent call him upset after their student with previous trauma came home triggered, having earlier taken a survey at school that asked, what is the hardest thing you've ever been through? It was a panorama screener. Dr. Laura Sanger is one of the few professionals in her field speaking out about this and employing her colleagues to do the same. I encourage you to watch this video if you haven't seen it already on Rumble or in Sinister SEL 4 if you get the chance. One thing's for sure, all these surveys your child answers equals a lot of data collection. Not all of this data collection is bad. A decline in some of the other indicators that are measured, like attendance, behavior, like office referrals, and coursework, can help identify children who are struggling, so interventions can be designed to keep them on track and graduate. That's a good thing. These indicators have objective, clear, measurable thresholds that are backed by research, while the same can't be said for tracking social-emotional skills. Some of you who are concerned about all this data collection from third-party vendors like Panorama may be thinking, I'll just opt out of these surveys, problem solved, or my school district doesn't use Panorama so my child's data is protected. It's not that simple. This company and these surveys aren't the only ways that social, emotional, or other data is being collected on your children. All that data equals money and education is a gold mine for ed tech companies. Which leads me to my next question. Is your students' and families' data protected? Politico doesn't seem to think so. This is an excerpt from an article published eight years ago entitled The Big Biz of Spying on Little Kids. Keep in mind as I read this that they are collecting even more data today than they did then. Quote, the amount of data being collected is staggering. Ed tech companies of all sizes, from basement startups to global conglomerates, have jumped into the game. The most adept are scooping up as many as 10 million unique data points on each child each day. That's orders of magnitude more data than Netflix or Facebook or even Google collect on their users. Students are tracked as they play online games, watch videos, read books, and take quizzes. The monitoring continues as they work on assignments from home, with companies logging children's locations, 
homework schedules, web browsing habits, and of course, their academic progress. Students shed streams of data about their academic progress, work habits, learning styles, and personal interests as they navigate educational websites. All that data has potential commercial value. It could be used to target ads to the kids and their families, or to build profiles on them that might be of interest to employers, military recruiters, or college admissions officers. The law is silent on who owns that data, but Kathleen Stiles, the Education Department's Chief Privacy Officer at the time, acknowledged in an interview that much of it is likely not protected by FERPA and thus could be commercialized by the companies that hold it. For those of you who haven't heard of it, the Federal Family Educational Rights Privacy Act, or FERPA, was enacted in 1974 to protect the privacy of education records and directory information, which includes name, address, phone number, date of birth, and email address, among other personally identifiable information. Schools are a rich source of personal information about children that can be legally and illegally accessed by third parties. With incidences of identity theft, database hacking, and sale of personal information rampant, there is an urgent need to protect students' rights under FERPA and raise awareness of aspects of the law that may compromise the privacy of students and their families. Why isn't it protected by the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act? Because in 2008 and 2011, amendments to FERPA gave third parties, including private companies, increased access to student data mostly because they wanted to monitor implementation and measure success of initiatives like Common Core. The 2011 amendments allowed the release of student records for non-academic purposes and undermined parental consent provisions. The changes also promoted the public use of student IDs that enabled access to private educational records. When we view that in light of the fact that many of these online assessment tools use digital education badges and digital currency-like technology, you have to start asking yourself, where is this going? And the implications are frightening. Data collected from assessments like the OECD study on social emotional skills that we talked about in Sinister SCL5, panorama screenings, and other SCL surveys embedded in curriculum that will measure students' social and emotional aptitude and provide them with a score, just like an academic score that goes in their report card, will follow them from preschool to age 20. The justification for many states who are implementing initiatives to teach and track SEL skills like this is a focus on building EQ, or emotional intelligence, to prepare future skilled employees for the workforce. They're not totally off base with this trend, but they are either naive or complicit in knowing what this truly means. Forbes notes that hiring decisions that used to be made based on schools attended, grades, and the status of their last employment are shifting to more intangible qualities like high EQ, or emotional quotient. Six seconds, the Emotional Intelligence Network seems to think that hiring people based on their emotional intelligence is the way to dismantle the systems that contribute to racism. Sounds like critical race theory to me. To see where this is going, note how the National Association of Colleges and Employers at their conference this last summer were talking about emotional intelligence, or EQ. Quote, Emotional intelligence is the ability to cognitively recognize, evaluate, influence, and manage our own and the emotions of others. Emotional intelligence is shaped by experiences and reinforced through explicit instruction of social and emotional skills. An excerpt from the Time for Learning Race in the Workplace series by Dr. Sean Harper and Damian Hooper Campbell suggests leaders tackling race in the workplace cannot continue to choose avoidance as an inclusive hiring strategy. To drive inclusivity in the workplace, Leaders must, quote, move past good intentions and hold managers and executives accountable in their hiring practices, end quote. When considering the recent emergence and investor impact of environmental, social, and corporate governance scores, it's not a stretch to imagine that businesses' scores could eventually be affected by how emotionally intelligent their workforce is and will make hiring decisions in the future based on if a candidate's inclusivity score is up to snuff. Again, you have to ask yourself, what is their definition of inclusivity, and how is it measured? Not to mention that organizations like the Gates-funded Data Quality Campaign and Jeb Bush's Chiefs for Change are lobbying for linking student-level data between education and workforce agencies via the statewide longitudinal data systems. They are asking Congress to lift the ban on a national student database, creating a federal student unit record by passing the College Transparency Act. What's going to keep anyone who has access to this information in the future 
from using our social emotional score, like China's social credit system, to eventually red flag and or punish students and their families for not agreeing with their views on issues like climate change, gender fluidity, or white privilege? Will our children's social emotional or EQ score be able to disqualify them from colleges or jobs or a loan if they don't meet their standard of inclusivity? Don't forget that in 2021, Biden called for the formation of a new National Credit Reporting and Scoring Division inside the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB. He wants to, quote, create a public credit reporting agency, or CRA, to compete with the three major credit bureaus and maybe one day replace them altogether. The Biden plan to build back better by advancing racial equity across the American economy proposal suggests that a government-run CRA could fix a credit reporting system that frequently holds consumers back from becoming homeowners due to problems like credit reporting errors and racial disparities. In the hands of those who value equity over equality, I shudder to think how this could be misused to target students or citizens who don't align their thinking with the government's. As you know if you've watched all the videos in this series up to this point, this agenda is coming from global entities like the UN and the World Economic Forum. Julianne Romanello sums it up nicely, quote, this kind of propaganda is how the necromancers of the WEF are going to con parents, schools, businesses, governments, and NGOs to start the emotional engineering early. EQ is linked to positive health outcomes in a bolstered immune system. While there is probably some genuine connection between EQ and physiological wellness, the social engineers are going to approach this from a, quote, preventative health or risk management standpoint. People who undergo EQ training will be rewarded. Lower insurance premiums, access to a broader range of opportunities, and those who abstain or refuse EQ training will suffer penalties. Importantly, the EQ industry will be tracking personality types and development and delivering education to improve EQ deficient individuals. Lots of ways to capitalize on and exploit this human capital racket, and I won't even mention autism. Bottom line, this is setting up human capital impact investing opportunities in which billionaire speculators can make big bets on whether or not an individual can be trained to be more resilient, gritty, empathetic, mindful, community-minded, anti-racist, change agentish, and leadershipy. In other words, the cookie-cutter, 21st century, mask-wearing, contact-tracering global citizen. So now that I've completely scared you, let's talk about some things you can do. Know your legal parental rights. Do you know which surveys, assessments, or curricula are opt-in and opt-out? Are you able to see the real survey questions being asked of your child or just sample questions because it's copyrighted material? Same goes for curriculum. We have to start asking questions about the measures being taken, if any, to guard our students' and families' information. If your child has a school-issued Chromebook, do you know what data is being gathered on there from third-party vendors? If your state, like mine, has extra laws and codes written that prohibit vendors like Panorama from selling data or using it to target ads to your children, is there actually anyone providing oversight of that to guarantee it's not happening? Or even oversight over EdTech software your schools have licenses for to check that the dynamic curricula they are providing doesn't teach material with a political agenda? Those who want to teach our children harmful ideologies through curricula and assessments know exactly what stands in the way of them and our children. Parents like us. As evidenced by the recent assault on parent involvement in education by the DOJ, the NSBA, and the like, they want to get rid of you and your powerful voice. We need to fight back and build that wall even taller and stronger. Ronald Reagan warned us that, quote, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Parents, the time to get involved is now. It's crucial. Don't just take my word for what I've told you about social emotional learning. Go do your own research so that you can have an elevator pitch and educate other parents, educators, your school district, members in your community, etc., about the real agenda behind social emotional learning. Start going to your local school board meetings and speak up respectfully using facts, not feelings. 
As you've seen throughout the series, I have used their own words and videos to show you what their agenda is. And most importantly, keep your family unit strong. Have dinner with your kids every night. Use that time to ask them what they're learning and what they're seeing happen at school. Teach them about history and talk to them about the dangers of the socialist communist welfare state. Help them to realize that it's a blessing they live in the United States of America. Why America's founding principles that provide equality of opportunity for all versus forcing equal outcomes truly allows us to have freedom and individualism instead of more government control and collectivism. If you've been following along for all six videos in this series, thank you so much for joining me and allowing me to educate you on this very important topic. I'm not done. I have more videos to put out. So if you want to learn more about what's going on in our school system and how to be parents of patriots, stay with me. Subscribe to my channel and then click the bell icon so you know when I put out new content. I'll see you next time.